three, two, one. Welcome to day four of the Focus Around Distractions Workshop. I am Penny Beeman with Uper Paws of Love. And I'm Cindy Campbell of Cindy Campbell Dog Training. And today we're going to talk about exercises. So we've talked a lot about what focus is and what um, games can help get better focus. We've talked about understanding our dog's emotions and, you know, how to keep them in a more calmer, neutral state than overexcited or over threshold state. And we've talked about the distractions in our environment. So today being day four really pulls that all together with exercises that we, why does the word exercises look like it's spelled wrong? <laughs> Anyways, exercises that we can do with friends and family or other people with dogs because dogs are the number one distraction for everyone that's registered. And what we see time and time again with adolescent dogs is dogs reacting to distractions. And whether that's reacting in an aggressive or fearful nature or whether that's reacting in a playful can we go say hi nature they're still reacting to seeing that dog that's in the environment so tonight's exercises are focused specifically on dog with dog exercises um, you can apply these to anything else although it can be harder to find say cats or squirrels or something that you can actually do the exercises with so reindeer. right <laughs> the reindeer get a little bit bothered by Azul. So while I could do this outside the reindeer pen, I wouldn't necessarily do it with a person walking a reindeer because that person could get injured. <laughs> so, and have access to reindeer. Right. So the first exercise that we're going to look at, uh, a lot of people might be familiar with. It's, I actually have two straight line exercises, and this is the first one that I do. So basically you wanna be in a field, could be a baseball field or just a large open area at a park or playground, but where you can get quite a distance apart. And so I use the example that you want dogs to be at least 10 to 30 feet apart. But if your dog is really easily reactive and tends to go over a threshold, you, this might be football field apart. You know, You might be 200 yards or more when you start this. And the more reactive your dog is, the more you wanna do this with another dog that's calm and is going to be less reactive to your dog. Right, because if both dogs are growling, barking, pulling toward the other dog, for one, you're way too close, but for two, it's gonna be hard to find that distance where both dogs can remain calm, mm -hmm. so. Um, but that's the goal. If all you have is two dogs that are somewhat reactive to each other, you can do this exercise, but you're going to want to be a good 200 yards apart or whatever distance that they can remain calm and under control and able to still listen to their handler. So basically both dogs start at the same end of the field. And I like to have either cones set up in the middle as a focal point or do this on the opposite sides of a fence if you have a baseball field and you can put the distance you need in between, something like that. The fence just provides extra safety if your dog is extra reactive, even though your goal is to keep them far enough apart, the fence gives you that safety if you can't control your dog, which we would hope that you would be able to control them at the distance you choose to work at, because that's the goal, keeping them calm and in focus. So if you can't control them, you're way too close. So you start walking at that great distance, whatever it is, I'm going to use the example of 30 feet apart. And you both start at the same basic starting point and have the same basic finish point with your barrier in the middle. And so even if you don't have a fence, just a sec, the cones give you that visual barrier. So you know not to approach that barrier. All right, Do go you ahead. have the slide? Do you have the slide of this? Um, yeah, you can't see it? No. Uh, so it didn't share apparently. Ah, I forgot a step. 
Sorry. Thank you for letting me know. Cause once I, once I um, pull my slides up, I can't see the screen. It's just easier to see what we're asking if you can. Exactly. And I meant to do that. I just can't see that. All right. Thank you. You should be able to see the slide now. All right. So my diagram shows the two dogs are in this one. They're starting at the left, working their way to the right of the screen. But, you know, it doesn't really matter what direction you are in the field as long as you're both walking the same direction. So you each pick a line with something in the middle to be your visual barrier. And it can be anything. It can be trees, cones, a playground, anything that you can both use as a focal point that you can, so the dogs can see each other through that barrier, but your, that helps you to walk your line straighter. So as you proceed on that line, walking the same direction, you wanna to try to maintain somewhat the same speed um, but it doesn't matter if you're a little off because some dogs do better actually a little bit behind and some dogs do a little bit better out front. The idea is you want the dogs to be able to see each other and still focus on their handler. So as you walk, you can slowly close that gap and maybe it's just taking one step closer to the line for every 10 steps you take. Or if your dogs are doing well and staying under control, you can take one step for every two or three feet you walk. You know, you have to judge that based on the dogs. So if either dog starts to get overexcited, you want to stop moving closer. You can keep walking in the straight line, but you want to stop closing that gap closer to the center line. If you don't have a super long area to do this in, you can just go to the end of the area that you have and turn around Correct. and go back. And it's a good idea if you have the dogs both on the same side, like if they're both on the inside, um, move them a little bit further apart. If they're both on the outside, they're more likely to be able to tolerate being closer together. Right, exactly. So same exercise, just a couple of tips. So as long as both teams are keeping their dogs under threshold and in that calm, able to focus, you know, basic, direction. So if they are used to healing or used to keeping the leash loose, they're able to do so. Every now and then you can stop and ask for a sit or a down. You know, any cues that they know because that will let you judge if they're really calm or not. And if they start to be unable to follow those directions, then you're too close and you want to, you know, maybe you stay at that distance a little bit or maybe take a break and pause for a little bit or maybe put just another foot or so in between you or switch them to the other side so that they can focus a little bit better. So if one dog struggles and they're just starting to struggle, so maybe they've all been calm and all of a sudden one dog takes a little bit of extra interest in the other dog, you guys can stop there and just kind of hold at that pace, run through those cues, you know, maybe play one of the games like the orientation game or the positions game that aren't like overly exciting, but is keeping the dog close to you, a hand target game, something like that, that helps the dog to refocus on their person and forget about that dog. If they can't play the game with you, then you might want to, you know, stay that distance down on your line, but then step sideways a little bit to see if that helps them focus on you again. And if you can get them to refocus, then you can start to advance again. So if you can't get them to increase, you know, if you can't get them to refocus, keep adding distance between you. You know, keep moving sideways, adding that distance between you until you regain the focus of both dogs or, you know, each handler regains the focus of their own dog. You want to keep the exercise successful for both dogs because if either dog goes over threshold, you need to stop the exercise right away, build distance, give the dogs a break. You might be able to repeat the exercise in a little bit, or you might have to stop for that day. We're going to go and, over that a little bit more in tips later on. And there's a significant chance if one goes over threshold, the other will too. And right. That's like the worst scenario. We don't want that. So while I'm a big fan of using a hands-free leash, 
when I'm doing exercises like this, I almost always have my hands on that leash. Even if I'm using the hands-free leash, I still have my hand down on my shorter strap or at least on my forward momentum handle because that way you can feel the dog if they start to move toward the other dog and you can capture their focus and calm them back down more quickly versus if they get the opportunity to actually full on lunge at the other dog, they could pull you over if you're using the hands-free leash or if you have a nice tight grip on your leash or they could pull that leash out of your hand and those are the kinds of things you wanna prevent. So keep your hand and you know, you probably don't, even if you're using a six foot leash, you probably don't want them walking a full six feet away from you because they can jerk so much harder. You want to keep them nice and close at a distance where they can more easily focus on you. Any other tips, Cindy, on this particular exercise? Um, just, you know, I think the biggest one is really be aware of what your dog is doing and what your dog is able to handle if you notice that they're escalating at all, it's better to add distance between the two dogs and keep that um, arousal down so, so that you don't have problems. The idea is to be successful, not right. to stress out the dog. And, and that's why you do this with like friends or family members with dogs or people, you know, it may be a total stranger as long as you both know you're working on the exercise together and you both understand the way you're going to go about it mm -hmm. so that you can like look at each other and know, okay, their dog is struggling. I'm going to stop here and wait for them to be able to regain focus. So you and need to be able to work together, even if you're not talking together. And sometimes going at a slower um, pace and using, if you're using rewards, they need to be calming rewards, not things that are going to hype the dog up. Correct. That's actually something that we talk about in a little bit too, because we have some general tips at the end of the slideshow that apply to all of the exercises. It doesn't matter what exercise you're doing, those tips apply. This is one of my favorites. So. Yes, I like this one. And if you're interested in AKC testing at all, the CGC test or canine good citizen test actually has a part where two dogs should be walking from opposite directions with their person. The people meet in the middle and stop and talk for a minute or shake hands and then move on and the dogs have to ignore each other. So this exercise is based on that but depending on how excitable your dogs are or how over threshold they get, again, you may start this exercise with a good 30 feet in between you. So you have that same middle barrier, the cones, the trees, the fence, whatever, for your focal point. And you start at opposite ends of the field. Or, you know, if you're in a huge field, you could only be starting at 50 feet away or 30 feet away and walk towards each other, wherever you can be successful. So one team starts at the left, one team starts at the right, and you slowly walk towards each other, which is going to be a little bit harder than the other exercise where the dogs are moving in the same direction at the same time, because now the dogs are going to want to hurry to get to each other. Whether they're happy to see each other or fearful of each other, they often will either hurry to get to each other or try to go the opposite direction which is what you want to prevent. So if they're trying to hurry or trying to run away, you're too close to that center barrier and you need to add more distance. Mm -hmm. So again, it's ideal is to be successful and keep your dogs calm. So if you have to be 200 feet away when you do it, you're 200 feet away. And then maybe a couple of days later, when you repeat the exercise, you're able to start at 100 feet away. You know, you slowly work in closer towards that center point. For this one, I would not work on getting too close to the center point until you've had a couple of successful back and forth sessions where, you know, you walk to your end point and turn around and walk back the other way. You want to be successful at the distance you are before you start decreasing that distance. So again, depending on the dogs, you may, when you're walking, say you start at 50 feet away and you walk toward each other, 
So your lines are 50 feet apart. So you're 50 feet from the person that's walking at you, plus you're maybe 30 feet distance across sideways from that person. So you're walking down your line and you may only get to where you, your dogs are about 20 feet on the line from the other dog and the dogs are starting to lose it. So at that point, you wanna stop and turn around and walk the opposite direction. So you're walking away from each other going back to the starting point and then turning around and walking back toward each other again. And each time you do that, you should be able to shrink that distance. The first couple of times you might only make it to the same 20 feet, but after some practice, you will be able to shrink that 20 feet down to 10 feet to you know, five feet or till you're actually walking past each other and continuing on the other way. But you wanna make sure you're keeping both dogs under threshold and both dogs are advancing at the same rate. So if one team starts to struggle and the other team is gonna see that because they're walking toward that dog, they just need to stop where they are and give that other handler a chance to get their dog refocused to see if they can proceed forward. So if one dog is really, really losing it, then the exercise needs to stop where they both turn around and walk the other direction. And that way one dog isn't getting closer. And you can alternate between these two straight line exercises where you're walking the same direction and then you're walking opposite directions. So you're walking toward each other or away from each other. So there are good things to go back and forth between. Now I did these two exercises with Nick and his frenemy um, Dobby and he and Dobby have had issues since a year ago December and they have not been able to be in the same part of Pet of PetSmart where we take a rally class together. Well, we haven't been able to be in the same part of in the same building in for in over a year. And um, we did this in a park. And by the end of our training session, Nick and Dobby were less than 10 feet apart, laying in downstays on the ground with both. Dobby's person and myself stepped back from our dogs. So it does work. It, um, now, Nick and Dobby still need more time with this together because they are frenemies and they do not, whatever for whatever reason, they want to go after each other. But, it, it, you know, I don't care if Nick likes the dog. He doesn't have to like the dog. He has to tolerate the dog. Yeah, he and doesn't have to interact with the dog. He, he just has to, to be in the same no, environment is, and focused on his person. Right. The other dog is none of his business and not his concern because I am the job. And so teaching them to do this. Uh, and then another, you if you, once you get past this, you can do this with recalls where you're at, you put your dog in a sit, stay and walk to one end of a long line and the other person does, is at the opposite direction. You can either do this parallel or um, opposite directions and you can have the dogs run past each other. Or you can have the dogs run with each other on recalls. Yep. Just and make that, sure they're far enough apart that they're not able to reach each other and tangle yes. lines because that's going to be bad. Yes, but, yes. but th that's another really good way for them to learn, you know, but this, that's also the way that's advancing past this. This is one of the ways to just, you know, okay. Right. I've After got you've been working on it a while and you can get them comfortable in the same two, environment. You know, when you're saying hmm, we're walking within two feet of the other dog and we're not having any problems, what do I do next? Then you start working on recalls. Right. So we talked about some things to do when dogs struggle, but this is kind of like the really important part of this exercise, because if you want to be successful, you need to keep your dog and the other dog from having those struggles to begin with. So there's a couple of things you can do, and Cindy already kind of touched on one of them, but so if they're struggling with advancing closer together or, you know, further down your line, sometimes if you just stop where you're at and either play a game at that point, as long as it's a low energy game, 
or you stop and do a down stay for a few minutes and just sit there and maybe calmly massage or pet your dog or talk in a nice calm voice, you know, whatever, giving them that break so that they're not advancing forward. Sometimes you can regain that focus and then proceed with the exercise. So give them that chance to just kind of stop and catch their breath and regroup. If they're staring at the dog for an extended amount of time, even if you're not making much progress on your line, they're bound to get more worked up. So if you can give them that break to play that short little hand target game or that short little orientation game in a low arousal kind of mode or hold that down stay, maybe, you know, one of the things that I like to do in that is my dogs are all trained to do a chin rest on my lap. So if I can get them to lay down and focus on me and hold eye contact and give me that chin rest, I know they're going to able to self calm themselves down. And so I might do that while the other handler is trying to get their dog under control. So the people don't have to be doing the same thing as long as they're both taking a break and not progressing on the line. You may be able to start the exercise up where you're at and move closer together, or you might have to go the opposite way and restart the exercise from the beginning again, depending on how excited the dogs are. And the more you practice and the more dogs you practice with, the easier it will become for your dog. And right. ultimately, the goal is we want our dogs to say, well, that other dog's none of my business. I'm going to look at mom or dad. And um, because mom and dad are the job, rather than, you know, oh, I, what's that dog doing? What's it going to do? That That's irrelevant. We don't care what that other dog's doing. If it's dragging its handler across a muddy field, we care what our dog is doing and it's our responsibility. So we want to play this with as many dogs as we possibly can. Sometimes it's going to be more successful than others, um, but we want to vary the, dif the distance. Um, we want to start out wide and move things in close. And I base that on like how overexcited or how over threshold the dog that I'm working with is around other dogs. So if you take Cam for existence, for example, you know, my more dog reactive dog, for him, I'm going to practice these types of exercises with the same two or three dogs over and over and over again, because not like right all on the same day, but you know, over time a couple of times each day over time with the same dog so that he can get to kind of trust those dogs before I add in a bunch of other dogs. Azul, when he works with the same dogs, I mean, he's a dog trainer service dog. So he's fairly used to going into a public space with other dogs, whether it's a dog he's never met before or a dog he's worked with several times. He's going to be overexcited for the first couple of minutes, and then he settles right in and remembers, oh, yeah, we're working, and this dog is following me, or I'm following this dog, and all is good because we're, I'm going to get to watch this dog for a while. So with that, I might, then I'm going to try to work with as many different dogs as I can on the exercises, because for him, he generalizes and gets to know the dogs he works with more than one time really quickly. Mm -hmm. So... You have to base that on your dog as to how many dogs you're doing the exercises with. And so I actually do this in a class setting, both of these exercises, where we may have six to eight dogs walking across a baseball field, all of them starting out going the same direction. And then we'll alternate where, you know, one is walking to the south while one is walking to the north and the next one is walking back to the south and one is walking back to the north so that they're practicing this with multiple dogs. So you can build up to it to a level that your dog is still successful and make the exercise more and more difficult based on your dog's ability to remain calm. But I would say start, especially with those over aroused dogs or fearful dogs, start with just one dog and do the same exercises on multiple different days with that same dog for a while. 
till you get better at it and shrink your distance a little bit. Then when you add in a new dog, you're probably going to have to start back at that same 200 yards you started with before, but the more you do it, you'll see that distance shrink more quickly. And at some point, it, you won't be starting at 200 yards. Right. But it takes practice and it takes teaching the dog the behaviors you want them to do. Because dogs seem to naturally pick the behaviors we don't want them to do, like pulling toward the other dog or barking or, you know, whatever that bad behavior is, spinning in circles or jumping or whatever out of excitement. They pick those behaviors that we don't like because that's what is reinforcing to them. So we need to teach them other behaviors and find ways to, to reinforce the behaviors we want in this situation so that they become more rewarding than the behaviors that are self-reinforcing to them. So my next exercise, this is a fun one, and I had to make it really big so we don't have a whole lot of text here. But I call it the shrinking circle exercise. And it kind of goes with that emotional level chart that we looked at on Tuesday and the different things. So if your dog is really, really overexcited, you're going to start and stay in the red circle. So this exercise can also be done with two dogs, four dogs, six dogs, even an odd number like five dogs. It doesn't matter you all start and stay on the same circle. The difference with that is the more dogs you have, the bigger circle you need. So even if I have a couple of dogs in this circle that are friends, such as one of Azul's good friends is Maverick and they do a lot of training together, now they could handle walking right beside each other. But if I put them right beside each other in an activity like this, they're going to be a little extra excited and then that's going to distract the other dogs we're working with. So even though they're friends with each other, I'm going to keep them probably on opposite sides of the circle to help keep them calmer and not wanting to pull towards their friend so that it makes it fair for the other dogs in the circle as well. So you start in the, you know, the biggest distance you can to keep dogs calm, and that's kind of the red circle, whatever that may be. And again, this might be the 200 yards. If you're working with just two dogs, it might only be 50 feet, but you wanna start pretty big and pretty easy. And most dogs will start out a little overexcited because not only are they following another dog now, they're also being followed by another dog, especially if you're working with more than just one other dog. If you're working with one dog, they may, you may be so far apart, they're not realizing they're following the same path. And I'll set cones out so we can help ensure everybody stays on the outside of the cones so that they can know the path to walk and they know the comfort level. And then as you see those dogs start to come down, you can slowly move those cones in so what I typically do, and depending on how big of a circle we start at and how well the dogs are doing, I'll pick whatever cone I'm closest to, or if I have a designated helper, I might have a helper do this, but then they just move that one cone they're closer to in by a foot, maybe a foot and a half. And then every time they come up to the next cone, they move that one in by a, fo a foot or to a foot and a half. So then as soon as you make a complete round, you've worked yourself into the orange circle without the dogs even really noticing that the circle just got a little bit smaller. So this is the circle you wanna work with with excited dogs that might not still be quite calm enough, but they're not like overreacting or fearful. They're just, you know, they're in that yellow or orange level on the emotional chart. They're excited and they're interested but they're still able to maintain their manners and a little bit of focus on their person. And you keep it at this distance until you see those dogs calm down into that more neutral state. And this tends to be really where you see them enter that more, all right, we've been walking about five minutes or maybe it's 10 minutes and we're just walking in a circle and nobody's getting any closer. You know, nobody's lunging at each other. We're all good, so we can just kind of chill. And this is where your focus is really going to start. 
And so this is your yellow circle. Take note of this circle, whatever distance this is. So it might have a diameter of 50 feet, it, or it might have a shorter diameter, depending on how many dogs you're working with. But take note of this distance, because when you start to get closer to this distance, you're going to start to lose focus, and you want to prevent that from happening. So as you start to lose focus, you may need to back up and work in this yellow circle longer, or you may need to just say that, all right, this yellow circle is as close as we're going to get for today, and we're going to stop and hold here for a little while, or we're going to go do a different activity and give the dogs a break. So the yellow circle is a really important one. If the dogs can remain calm in the yellow circle and focus on their handler, then you can move into the pink circle. Again, moving the cones. One person moves each cone as they come to it. So it's just about a foot. And this time you want to be careful to keep it at a foot or, you know, a distance that will help the dogs be successful. And between the yellow and the pink circle, you really want to be pulling out your focus on me tricks. So whether that's a hand target or that's, you know, that the higher value treats or whatever is going to keep your dog focused on you more than the other dog. And so if all the other dogs are being successful at that pink distance and one dog is struggling a little bit, that one dog can maybe walk just a little bit faster, but stay on the, you know, the yellow circle path. So they're taking a wider circle around the cones to keep their dog a little bit calmer. And if more than one dog is struggling at this distance, then this is where you need to end it for that day and just either stay between the yellow and pink lines and just do this. So if you can progress a little bit quicker, you enter into the blue circle. Whether you get as close as you want to or not, the last circle is the one that I want the dogs to just stop. I'll, I'll have a cone out for every dog. And then I will have every dog stop at the next cone they come up to. And here we will just hold. And the handler can choose whether they're going to put their dog in a sit or a down or have their dog standing next to them, or whatever is easiest for that dog, but they're gonna stay at that hold and try to be calm. And then hopefully whoever is leading the exercise can have a moment for a discussion. You know, if it's a trainer, maybe they're talking about a force-free training tip, which is what I tend to do here. Or if it's not a trainer, the person that like gathered this group of dogs could mainly say, how does everybody feel at this different at this distance? Are we good? What should we do next? You know, and just hold that position for, you know, three to five minutes to allow the dogs just that time to chill. The other importance is that don't shrink this circle so small that any dog is closer than say six feet closer to each other, especially not the first couple of times you practice the exercise. If you're walking with the same three or four dogs regularly, you might push that and get within four feet of each other. But ideally, when you're first practicing this, the dogs are a little excited and you want to keep them at at least six feet. It might be 10 feet, might be 12 feet, whatever it takes to get the calms, the dogs calm. But no closer than six feet is my goal for a class when we have multiple dogs. Yeah, I don't like my dogs closer to any dogs than six feet at any time for any reason, unless I know the handler very well. Right. And that's just it. The only time we get closer than six feet is dogs that work together well, such as Azul's friend Maverick. We've spent mm -hmm. so much time with that handler and dog team that we can now walk right beside each other, even through a busy store or one right behind each other, even close enough where one dog can sniff the other dog's butt, which tends to give them a little bit of goose and makes them lose the focus. So we try not to get that close, but almost to that point because we've developed that over time. I don't do that with just any dog. Even if my dog remains calm, I wanna have that six foot barrier between me and another dog. So that's just my condition and what it's I like a, for my dog. Safety, it's a safety factor. And 
you know, even going to the last show I went to, my friend gave me a ride and she had her mail lab in the way back of her car and he was not being the most cooperative. And I, I had a crate I could have stuck in easily, but I was having issues. I didn't want to put any more equipment in the car than I had to. So I, rather than deal with dogs popping over seats or, you know, that kind of stuff, we kept the dogs six feet apart by putting Nick at my feet. So, and then nobody was unhappy. Nick was at my feet, curled up, sound asleep. Murdoch was in the back. You know, he was happy. He wasn't getting stressed out that somebody else was in his car. And Yep. I actually have a lot of clients who have seizure disorders, so they're not allowed to drive. So I will pick up a lot of clients and have a lot of extra dogs in my car all the time. And so there's a couple of different things that I do based on who that is. Sometimes Azul takes the front seat, so he's with me. That way, if he needs to alert while I'm driving, he has that ability. And then we have a barrier, and the person can sit in the back seat with their dog so they can keep their dog from invading Azul's space, and we can keep Azul from invading their space. Or I also do drive an SUV, so if we really need to, we can keep Azul in the front seat and the other dog in the far back with the handler in that back seat mm -hmm. so that they can keep th their dog from moving closer. So there are I, ways in environments like that where you can keep that six foot distance from dogs that are not used to being so close. Well, and it, the funny thing, Mo, is like Murdoch and Nick are used to seeing each other in class all the time. So it was just kind of funny, but he was being, he was being, it was show day. He'd been to the show the day before he needed his space. And it's like, I don't want to interfere with his showing. Let's just. And sharing see. vehicles is tough, especially mm -hmm. if a dog has not been conditioned to do it. Azul's pretty yeah. much done it most of his life with different dogs. So he's pretty conditioned to do it, but I'm still not about to put a dog he's never met before in my vehicle because he needs that space and I need to trust that he's going to be calm and not try to go through my barrier while I'm driving. I need to be able to keep him under control. Right. And that's where it's nice. Not everybody can afford them, but it's nice to have crash tested crates. It's not or always a barrier possible, at least yeah. or at least barrier. And um, that's my preference because it's pretty hard to get out of a crash tested crate. Right. Um, but it's not always possible. So, you know, and the initial thought was we were going to put Murdoch and Nick in the same crate. And I'm like, mm, I didn't really feel great about it. But, you know, he's a service dog. He can sleep at my feet. Right. He's done it before. So getting back to this exercise, we already talked about the diameter of the circles is based on the number of dogs. If you have two dogs, you may not be as far apart. If you have five dogs, you're probably going to start at a bigger distance apart because five dogs is going to add more excitement. So you need to make sure that you can start at a distance that all dogs can easily focus on their handler. If one dog struggles, they can move further out of the circle. But if more than one dog struggles, you need to stop getting closer. So... It's, this is a really important exercise that I like to implement when I'm teaching a group class, like my focus around distractions basic class, because in the first couple of classes, we have dogs that don't really know each other and they need to get used to each other. So we'll always start each class with an extended sniff about with dogs really far apart. And then we'll start with the straight line exercises so they can get used to seeing the other dog move more with them. And then we'll go into the shrinking circle exercise till I think we hit our closest point we can get and we'll stop and hold and discuss our next steps for the class. So I put these three exercises together quite regularly when I'm working with new dogs. They all complement each other well. Mm -hmm. So we do have more exercises in our crazy canine adolescence classroom if you're interested in more things that you can work on to help keep your dogs 
calmer while working around other dogs and give them the skills they need to be successful around other dogs. But here's a couple of exercise tips for you. So you want to be sure that you don't push any one exercise too long or too far. It's really important to end each exercise on a successful note. So if you accidentally go just a foot too far, then you wanna back up and continue the exercise a little bit at a distance where you were successful at so that you're ending on a good note. I also try to keep each exercise short, like less than 10 minutes of any one activity because after that, the dogs get bored and they start to have other issues. So, 10 minutes into any one exercise, whatever level we're at, we want to stop, you know, have a petting party with your own dog or play a game with your own dog or go out on your own sniff walk, whatever you need to do for like a five minute break. And then either reset the exercise you just did or move on to one of the other exercises. But you want to make sure that you're not taking the dogs past their ability to pay attention for a training session as well. So if you have younger dogs, like six months and younger, then you probably only wanna do maybe three exercises for a total of 30 minutes with a five to 10 minute break in between each exercise, or even cut them shorter than 10 minutes so that you can have a longer break. And if you're working with older dogs that can focus for a longer period of time, then you might be able to do four or five exercises in a row with that five to 10 minute break in between for games. Go ahead, Cindy. I was going to say, if 10 minutes, that's a long time for a puppy. Right, right. And I mean, it it depends on the dogs. And if you need to call it earlier than that, I just say less than 10 minutes because you might only be able to do the exercise for three or four minutes if you're not starting at a good distance. If you're starting at a good distance, you're going to be able to do the exercise longer. And if you have a poodle, you can't do reps. They don't do reps. Right. Which is why we take the five to 10 minute break in the middle, play a game, and then do a different exercise. You can always come back to this exercise later, but, you know, work for less than 10 minutes on one exercise. Take that five to 10 minute break in between. Make sure that you're including water on at least one or two of those breaks as needed, depending on the temperature of the environment you're working in. And keep it short based on the dog's success. If they're not being successful, nobody's happy and nobody's working well. So you need to make sure you base that time limit of the exercise and the amount of time in a break based on the dogs you're working with. It's also better to stop sooner rather than later. So stop before, if you can, stop before there's any issues. Correct. So if you get like three reps and everything was perfect, stop. You're done. You don't need to do Oh, yes, definitely. You know, if it's five reps, stop. You're done. You don't need to do anything. You know, if it gets much more than that, I would stop anyways because and find something that they can be successful at because you want them to be, feel like, oh, okay, I did good. I, ma- I made mom, mom or dad happy. The more you end on a successful note, the more quickly your dogs will progress in these exercises and be able to get closer. It takes on average 20 good activities to counterweight one negative experience. So if you Mm -hmm. did the straight line activities and ended badly just once, that means you have to do that same activity 20 more times and end on a positive note in order for that to be successful and your dog to kind of forget about that one bad activity. And obviously you don't want to do it 20 times in the same day. So, you know, if you're doing it more than two or three times in the same day, you want to stop there and do something else and then come back to it at a later day with some time in between those days for calming activities so that you're not trigger stacking your dog. Mm -hmm. So between exercises, when you take that pause, there's a couple of things you can do. You can do a pause. I already mentioned, you know, to go get water one dog at a time, or, you know, every dog has their own water bowl. However, you decide to set that up. 
You can do downstays where you're doing grooming or and practice with your dogs, or you can increase the distance and go play a quiet little game with your dog. Anything that helps your dog to calm down and refocus on you. Mm -hmm. So it, go it ahead. Should be it should be enjoyable to the dog. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. We hope you like it, but it should be enjoyable to the dog. Right. So That's like, the most important point to this exercise. If my your dog Pyrenees, is not enjoying it, you're pushing them too hard, too fast. My Pyrenees loves to be brushed, but on her terms. So just, you know, maybe it's three strokes of brushing her that night. That's fine. That's all she's going to get. You know, Nick has, is a totally different dog and he's going to want different things. So you just have to adjust what they want versus, you know, he'd probably rather play squirrel than get groomed. So yes. you just have to figure out what works for your dog and what makes them happy. And try and, to avoid any of those really high arousal games. High arousal games have a time and place, you know, maybe mm -hmm. right after you're done with exercises and dogs kind of go their own way, you could do a more high arousal game because that will help them retain what they learned. But while you're working through the exercises on one particular day, don't do any of those high arousal games in that exercise, unless you've been working for the same dogs, with the same dogs quite often, so that you're building that into like the next step of making the exercises harder for them. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm working with Azul and his friend Maverick, we do add some high arousal games into it because that's part of teaching them to come back down from those high arousal games. But they're dogs that know each other well and will snuggle and lay together just fine or get up and play or whatever because they're happy in each other's company. So you have to kind of base that arousal level on whatever it takes to be successful for the dogs that you're working with on that day. Right. And let's not get, uh, get it wrong. It's important. It's extremely important, especially when you're trying to create more focus to be able to teach your dog how to think in high arousal and to, to think in arousal up and arousal down. If you don't, they're gonna get distracted and they're not going to be able to disengage from the squirrel they see or the other dog they see. You want them to disengage from that. And one of, so that parallel walking, it actually is an arousal up, arousal down game because they have to think about how they're feeling with that other dog next to them or that other dog approaching them. Or that other dog walking the circle with them, yes. Yeah. So and th those are all important skills. There's some other things we can teach you for arousal up, arousal down uh, that you can do on your own. But those, those are really important because your dog really needs to know how to react around other dogs, not just himself. And react in appropriate ways. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I really like to do um, is when we've done these exercises, after you've done a couple of the exercises, you kind of have a feel for how close your dogs can be, whether you're working with one other dog or three other dogs or whatever. At the end of the exercises, you should have a distance in your head of how close those dogs can actually be to each other and still remain calm. So I like to go for a short walk with those dogs, basically taking what you practiced in the exercises and putting it in a more real life situation. However, you wanna make sure that you maintain that distance that they can be successful. So I tend to do these exercises at a ball field that's really close to a one mile walking trail. And so if we're able to get dogs within say 20 feet of each other, we can walk down the same trail at that 20 feet distance apart and walk the trail where the dogs can see the other dogs be around the other dogs and extend the time, but then engage in the trail like they normally would, whether they're sniffing or walking in a heel or whatever it is that they would be doing with their person in that type of environment while still somewhat keeping an eye on that dog. And that kind of helps drive home Cindy's point of the other dogs really aren't my business. 
you know, my person, my mom, my dad, whoever my handler is, is my business, not the other dogs that are walking this trail with us. So if you don't have a walking trail, you can do this like around the outside of the field that you've been working in, or you can maybe go to a nearby road or whatever is in your environment I that know. allows you to keep that distance that you need. Go ahead. I just said sidewalks work. Oh, yep, uh, sidewalks park. if you're in an urban area, area. Parks work. I happen to be fortunate enough to live near two fairly large parks that are connected to another park that has um, a whole other set of playgrounds and stuff, a whole other set of kids. So having those options available, look around. Um, you know, maybe it's on the inside of a neighborhood that you don't know about, but explore and look because they're out there. I mean, I live in the middle of town and I've found a creek and um, I guess technically it's a um, canal for the water system in California, but it's a creek where it goes by, by me and there's all kinds of wildlife. And so it's really good for training because there's geese and squirrels and heron and egrets and all kinds of stuff. You don't know what's, uh, we, I had an egret land in front, or a, excuse me, a heron land in front of me, not 10 feet from me and Nick one day. You never, you know, so you never know what's gonna happen. And it's a good idea to have the, your dog like, okay, mom's my business, mom's my job. And so if they're thinking in that mode, then having the hair and land in front of you is not going to be a big deal. We actually live in a totally different environment because we are more rural out in the middle of nowhere. So it's hard for us to find a sidewalk area without being right downtown, which I mean, our downtown is probably like a normal neighborhood for most people. But <laughs> So it's hard to find sidewalks without being in a more congested area, but we have trails everywhere. So we can more easily find a trail that we can walk and pick a quieter trail where we know that it's going to be just the group of dogs we're working with versus a busier trail where we're going to have a lot of strange dogs coming at us while we're on our walk with the dogs we've been practicing with in the exercises. So you have to base that on the environment that you're around and the other things in your environment as far as houses, businesses, wildlife. But you can mm -hmm. make that walk work in whatever environment that you're most likely to be in with your dog on a day-to-day -day basis. So now we get to talk about the fun part of the evening, game time. And so Cindy, I'll let you go ahead and introduce your game for day four. Okay, so my day four game, um, it goes by many names, um, but um, I, I like magic hand or um, it's a form of a hand target. And pretty much what you do is you have your hand elevated above the dog's head with, here we'll put some food, actual food in it. With, I have, that. it's not gonna show. I have cat food in it. And so as it's above the dog's head, you open your fingers and you let a piece of food drop and the dog catches it. Um, what it does is the ideal place to do this when you're holding your hand and doing this is with your elbow in like at your hip and then your hand out about a 90 degree. You can't see what I'm doing, but it's out. At about so a out 90. to your side, yeah. <laughs> I can't so do it that way while I'm walking <laughs> or while I'm sitting. It's at a 90 degree angle. So from your shoulder to your um, wrist, your elbow's at a 90 degree angle. And so what this allows you to do is walk with your dog directly under your hand. They're gonna be interested because stuff is um, falling falling from it and actually what I have found in the course of doing this especially with my fussy dog is you don't need as high value treats to get the same response out of this because the food's moving and it's a it becomes a game just to catch the game 
the really cool thing about this is if you're working on teaching your dog to heal for um, competitive obedience or rally, your hand has to be on your stomach roughly while you're walking and doing the, the course. So it's very easy to switch that over to putting your hand on the, on your stomach. So if you're walking your dog and, you know, say you need to get your dog's attention, either putting your hand in, you know, this position where you're going to be dropping food. I usually carry food on me so that I can drop food as needed. But they know that that means something's coming. And then they're focusing up. They've got their head up and looking at your hand. You don't necessarily want to do this for a whole lot of time because you don't want to um, cause neck problems with your dog. But this is a really good way to get them focused off whatever might be distracting. Or you're the job so that they know what they're supposed to be doing. It's really simple. The only thing, well, with Nick, I had taught him to catch food before, you know, to throw food and catch it when, before I taught him to catch dropped food. With Poe, she just picked it up, but she's a food whore. She, she's a food, well, I'm going to use the you word, can she's say a food it. whore. <laughs> and she will, she will do anything for food. So she just picked it up on her own. And um, it really, really ups the ante of getting that focus on you when you're trying to do things. The other way to do it if you don't want to carry it near food is you can put food in um, a check it and you can drop a piece of food out of the check it and the dog will catch it. Or even a cup a, you could a use. A cup will if work you or, one a at a time. or a ladle will work. But it, I, it's just a really good and handy game to get them focused on you. I really like this game because it works well with the exercises because it keeps the dog calm. And even mm -hmm. if you don't have a dog that can catch it, if you're in a field, you know, like at a park or a baseball field or something in the grass, even if they're not catching it, if it drops on the ground, the act of sniffing and finding it is going to help calm them down. So you might have to stop walking so that they can find it every time you drop one, but well, Nick, that's okay. Nick still doesn't catch every single one, but we stop, we let him find, I let him find it. And he finds if he can't, if he really has a problem finding it, I will throw a second piece down. And but it's a really, it's such a powerful game. I try and play it every day for at least a few minutes, and uh, it really, it really, really makes a difference when you step into the you know into the competitive ring and you already have this behavior trained and you don't even have to think about it. And it's, it's really a nice thing to have. And it's, it's nice when you're in the grocery store and you don't want your, you want your dog to come in close. It's nice when you're in a crowd and you want your dog to come in close. And you can it's actually end up using that as a hand signal, phasing out those treats that are dropping when you're in a public environment like that, and then give well, a bigger I, reward at the end of the activity you're that's doing. What I, that's what I do because I can't give treats in the ring. So he gets treats when we're done. When, but so he knows even the, because to switching it over to a hand signal, I just bring it, I just brought my hand over to my stomach. I didn't even have to gradually do it. I just did it. And he knew that my elbow bent was a good indication that he was going to get treats. So I, I can't say enough of how much this has helped Nick with so many different things and getting his focus back on me because he's, in, or if he wants to catch those treats, he's got to be looking at my hand, and, which means he has to be paying attention to me. Right, because you never know when a treat's going to drop. Right, exactly. And, you know, initially when you're teaching it, you want to drop it like every step or two as you get 
more skill with it, you can increase the distance. But there's a couple places where we walk where we have trouble spots. And I intentionally increase the amount of treats he's getting during those, when we're in those areas walking. And, or if I see a cat, he likes to eat, he wants to eat cats. If I see a cat, you know, we start increasing the, the treats where we do some other things, but to get his attention back on me and it works. So, you know, you know it, it's a good game for real life environments when you see a distraction exactly. before they see a distraction and to help give you that time to create space if you need to, because if they see that hand in that position and go, Ooh, food's coming. Let's go with mom, whatever direction you're turning to go. They've had that built in. So practice first, but then it's a good game to take out into real and, world stuff. And you can't practice it too much because it's one of the, my, my feeling, my philosophy with training is you want to train for the situation, not in the situation. And you want to overtrain it for the situation. Yes. You can't overtrain loosely, loose leash pressure. You can't overtrain leaving a situation, multiple ways to leave a situation. And it just takes time to get through those. And you can't overtrain what the response is. You know, like today we were within two feet of a squirrel, and that's one of Nick's, like, I want to go eat the squirrel type things. And he's, I'm starting to work with him on skills he'll need for hunt titles and for hunt um, tests. And so he'll have to sit when squirrels run left, when squirrels run, run right, when bunnies go by, when quail go by, when ducks fly, you know, when deer, run, the deer runs past, because you never know what mother nature is going to throw at you, and he's going to have to remain in a sit. So now, every time we see something, we're sitting, but that could include, oh, you're sitting, now you, here's the magic hand and magic food's going to appear. Right. I, I really okay. like that game a lot. I've played it, especially it, with younger dogs. You oh, it's can a, also incorporate toys to an extent, like Azul's love of tug. So I can hold that tug hand, that tug in my hand so that it's sitting on the top of my hand where he knows he doesn't have access to it yet, but it's coming. And so that or, I can do that when we see that distraction up ahead and to keep his focus on me to do the U-turn that we practiced yesterday or whatever. To, so he sees that tug. Oh, we're going to play soon. Let's go with mom and then give him the toy when he actually does the U-turn and comes my way. I've seen some really good videos with basically this game where they took a um, one of those balls that are about this big that are just like an open mm -hmm. mesh ball and the dog was holding on to it and they were holding on to the ball and they were basically using the ball for healing practice. Right. And, you know, it, that's a really good way. You want to make that a game, but this, this magic hand and is really, really helpful. And, you know, it's, it's also very adaptive if you have any disabilities that involve your hands, if you can't hold the treats in your hand and you know control how much comes out between your fingers you can use a, a chuck it or you can use there's adjust and there's adjustable chuck it's where you can adapt the length so that um it you know it's longer or shorter you can so even use a squeeze tube for you know a higher mm -hmm. value treat and just give a little yeah. bit at a time because they're going to see the hand holding that tube and know oh something's here so yeah it's lots of different really, adaptabilities it's just a really useful game and there's probably a million and one uses for it but um definitely healing and getting focus in, during healing is a big one so penny what's your game yeah, I'm going to change things a little bit because that was our calming game for the night. And now we're going to amp our dogs up with my game. So this is after you're done with all the exercises and after you're putting a lot more distance in between dogs and you want to just give your dog that jackpot kind of reward. Um, 
my game is actually using the flirt pull, or sometimes it's called mm -hmm. the whip it game. So I'm going to share my screen again so that you can see what I'm talking about as I talk about it. So, all right, here is Azul. And he actually got this flirt pull for his birthday last year because that's when he was starting to get like, he wasn't enjoying all of his food reinforcement anymore and Tug was starting to lose a little bit of luster, yet he was still really struggling with other dogs around. So we got this to build his value for me. And basically this one is a horse lunge or a horse whip, if you want to call it that. Um, we're just never going to whip our dog with it. <laughs> no. So, you need to be very clear about that. This is not for hitting your dog. Right. And it shouldn't be used for hitting horses either. But, no, it's a guide. <laughs> right. So you can attach any kind of toy to it. I've got a rope toy that has kind of a bigger knot on the end here. And so Azul and I are just kind of learning how to use it on this particular day. And I have a couple of pictures from this day. But so at this particular time, we're working in a ball field that's totally enclosed. So he is off leash. About 150 yards away is a playground and the entrance to the walking trail I was just talking about a little while ago. So a lot of dogs are walking by. We also have deer that walk naturally on the outside of this fence and whatnot. And so I'm wanting him to focus on me more than anything else he sees around him. And so there's a couple of things with using a flirt pole. I do suspend in circles because Azul loves that, but you want to make sure that if you're doing circles, they're kind of big and at a speed that is good for your dog. Because if you look at Azul's body language here, he's kind of really tight to me and you can see he's not centered and balanced. So if he wasn't conditioned for this kind of running and turning on a dime, he could really injure himself if he stopped too fast or slipped on the grass or something. Um, since he's done a lot of tug and whatnot and a lot of play with other dogs, he's very conditioned for this type of exercise. But you want to be careful with that. And so I also you also want to make sure that you're careful with the height at which you're doing it. Azula likes to jump and I don't let him jump very often. So with this particular toy, I'll let his front feet come off the ground in a jump. I try to make sure it's low enough to keep his back feet on the ground so he's not doing a full jump. And then we just kind of go through moving it with the occasional, all right, see, he got it because like any other tug game, your dog has to be successful occasionally or they're gonna lose interest. So he got the toy and I'm going to stop and just kind of let him chew it. I want to keep the line a little bit tight, but I'm not really tugging on it because I don't want to break anything or pull too hard or whip the toy out of his mouth. So I'm just giving a gentle of enough tug for him to enjoy that pleasure of pulling on it. And now I'm going to kind of let the line go slack here because this is where I'm resetting. And this is how I build in the on off switch that we talked about yesterday. And we're still building it in with the high excitement of the flirt pull at this particular time. But so for my cue for Azul with the flirt pull is first the line will go slack. That means I'm all done tugging. And then the tip of the flirt pull where it hits the rope that's attached to it goes to the ground. So when that pulls on the ground, Zul knows game is done. We're not playing right now. And we'll take that. So that's usually his cue to drop. So if our line gets tangled for any reason, that's the first thing we do. Tip of the pole goes down. He knows it's an all stop kind of position. And he has to drop the toy before we start it again. And so here he is in the waiting pose. He's dropped it. I've moved it a little bit further away, but I'm holding it still. And I want to be really careful to give him the get it cue before I start moving it again so that he's not breaking his stop without a cue. You know, I don't want to move it too fast and have him break his stop because then his stop cue is going to kind of start to be meaningless. So I want to make sure I give the get it, give it cue just before I start moving it. And sometimes that backfires a little bit. So he grabs it too early because he's so fast at getting it. 
So you gotta kind of be careful there with your timing. Um, if he does get it, we just kind of stop again and reset and do it again. But so then this is where he's going full bore after it again, because we just started and he's gonna run. And that was the end of that day. So just a couple of pictures from that. So it can be a really good thing to get extra excitement from your dog. I gotta stop sharing the screen. Oh, it looks like I did. Okay. Stop. So we actually you, take this. You got a question or? Oh, I, I just had a comment. I always, I do this also with Nick and I have a smaller cat hole, the cat whip that, um, and no, I do not whip cats with it. Um, but what I do, I play with Nick with it in the house and we play a game where we play play cue play where we play with the whip the whip and then he gets a cue a verbal cue to sit down um stand bow pretty something of that nature and he has to do that behavior and then I'll tell him nice and then we start playing so there's a couple different ways you can do that you know there's, you can play the way Penny does, where you have a stop start cue, or you can play with a um, behavior cue. The night, something to consider when you're playing with your dogs is if you're working on specific behaviors, if they know it well enough that you really want to start proofing it, this is an excellent way to find out how well they know that behavior because they go up and down and up and down with their thinking with their arousal and they have to think about how well do I know that cue so it's exactly like, go ahead you can it, finish it becomes like Simon says for the dog and it's a really really good way for them to gain some self-control that's exactly why I start off with the on off switch for this particular type of play because they have to have that ability to come down before they can listen to the other cues. So mm -hmm. there's going to be a couple of videos shared with this one. One is going to be me and Azul and playing in the snow. So you can see some of the other cues that I give, such as I tell him to drop, or I'll tell him to leave it, or I'll tell him to get back. Or he actually likes to step on the rope so that I can't start it again. So I'll tell him to get off it and things like that. So I do use a lot of other cues once they mm -hmm. understand the on off switch and learn to move in that arousal state. And then we're also going to share a video. I have one that Cindy has done with Nick where he's chasing it and doing some of his body positioning cues that she does with him, like the sit and down and stuff. And he's fast in the house. Yeah. So you can see we're both examples of that and the way that we play in the workshop after this video, along with the directions of how we get started with teaching activities like this. And they're a lot of fun. I mean, and just five minutes of playing whip, of playing um, whip it games are, they're physically challenging for the dogs because just about every time I stop Nick's panting and he's clearly does not want to stop. He's very much into this game. Almost, he, the only one that comes close to it is Toy Switch, which is another thinking in arousal game and he I last time I played that with him I was really impressed with how much he actually could switch toys right I also play with this game like outside of the dog park kind of like what we do with the exercises we learned tonight but there I'll have Azul on a long line that's clipped to me so we have to be very careful of tangles and this is after we got much more skilled at using the flirt pole but so we'll start a good distance, like 200 yards away from the dog park, playing with the flirt pole. And I usually slowly move closer to the dog park, before, you know, without Azul really knowing that we're moving closer. And when he disengages from me to look at dogs, say he hears dogs barking or whatever, then I know we're at the closest distance we can get at that point. So we'll back up a couple of feet and play more with the flirt pole. And then we'll take a break to do some other training at that distance. And then we'll play with the flirt pole some more and see if we can move closer. 
So I do a lot of that stop and start and stop and start with this so that we're not doing it for more than three to five minutes at a time with breaks in between and refocusing on other stuff. Mm -hmm. So that it, pretty much, go ahead. I was gonna say it can be pretty draining physically and mentally, especially as you start adding more cues into the game. And then you can add multiple cues, like you stop them and you have them do one cue. Like I do this to Nick all the time. I think he hates it. Not, he does he loves, but hates it. Um, where he's got a down, he's got a sit, he's got a down, he's got a pretty, he's got a stand, he might have to bow, he's got to do multiple things, and then he gets released to, to go play. And right. so it really, it, but the that play is such high, val high value to them, you've got to, you know, you've got to watch them, because if you let them do it too long, they are going to get they get overexcited and stop being able to listen to cues if they've played mm -hmm. too long as well. Mm -hmm. So this pretty much wraps up day four of the workshop and we advertise this workshop as a four day thing. So if this is the last thing you do is playing with your dog, then that's okay. But we wanna just let you know that tomorrow we're gonna do kind of a teaser video and launch the new um, crazy, K-9 Adolescence Classroom, which is a new online classroom. And we want you guys all to be able to see how that classroom is set up and the lessons inside it and kind of that basic thing. So if you feel like tuning in tomorrow, that will be on the Uper Pause page tomorrow and you can get kind of a sneak peek of that classroom and also get the information for how, if you want to register for that classroom, you can do it. All of the games and exercises that we've done in this workshop are just a small portion of the games and exercises that are actually built into that classroom. And you can earn a certificate for participation in that virtual classroom as well. So, if that does interest you, I know a good majority of the people registered for this workshop have adolescent dogs somewhere between six months and two years old. So if you're interested in that, feel free to check out the Uper Paws page tomorrow. The Facebook event page will actually end before then. So if you want to see it on Facebook, I'll have it posted on my main Uper Paws of Love account on Facebook as well. And Cindy will probably share it on her page as well. Mm -hmm. but that way you can access it that way if you want it. No pressure. You don't have to check it out. We just want to make sure that you know it's available in case you're interested because we do have a whole ton more of resources for you. So I do want to just kind of say about the flirt pool because I forgot to mention this. If we obviously want you to play this game on day four, but you may not have a flirt pool. So there's a really quick, easy way to build a homemade one for a temporary use. So I will take a rope or an old piece of leash that is roughly about six foot long and strap a toy on the end of that. And so you may not be able to get that as high in the air, depending on how heavy of a toy you actually put on the end, but you can still spin it around and move it quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. You could even take an old broom handle and attach the rope to if you want to get a little bit of distance away from your body. Say you are somebody who has to do games like this sitting in a chair. So you could get it further away from your body that way. So there's a couple of different ways you can do a homemade temporary flirt pool to see if it's something that you really enjoy or your dog really enjoys before you go investing in one. I found my horse whip on Amazon for about $17. And I found um, actual, um, they're actually called flirt poles. I found multiple flirt poles for around 15, 14 to $15 on Amazon. Right. And some of them, like the one I have is actually collapsible. So it collapses to about that long, about a foot long, and then you can extend it out and lock it. Mm -hmm. So you can use it as a, a flirt pole. I asked a fellow Husky owner and dog trainer what he used with his dogs when I started shopping for mine because I looked at a smaller one 
And he said, with huskies, because of their strength and speed and abilities, the horse whip would last longer. And since it was only like $2 more expensive than the ones that are made for dogs, I took his advice and I'm glad I did. <laughs> yeah, so, well, the, the horse whips are, they're also readily available to most people locally because if they're you have a farm store or something. At, like tractor supply or mm -hmm. any place that sells tack. And um, they're really, and the, the other thing is they're more flexible. It um, extends your cool. reach further. And if you have a large breed dog or an aggressive chewer, they're far less likely to break it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because of the way they're, because they're a fiberglass pole, they're more flexible. Right, they're meant to be flexible. And Azul has bet mine, you know, I don't know if we have any people that are fishermen or fisher ladies out there. You ever catch that big fish and watch your pole bend? He's bent the flirt pole like that multiple times. Yeah. And it's, I like that it's flexible like that so that he doesn't get hurt and I don't get hurt. It doesn't quite snap back straight like a fishing pole would have you ever been hit by a lunge whip that's done that uh, not <laughs> because i haven't used one with horses i've only used it with azul and he doesn't fling it back at me so yeah no i can say no never me. done that <laughs> <laughs> my sister used it on me <laughs> but yeah. that's another story <laughs> Yep, I can see that happening, but it's something I can say Azul has never done to me. <laughs> and I've played with Cam and a handful of other dogs too, because I usually will take this to some of my classes when we want to do a more high arousal activity, one dog at a time, which They're is just a really fun toy that most dogs really like. And it, it drives up their hunting, their hunting drive a little bit. But it's control the way if in you a play, safe environment to do in a so. Safe environment, but the it, you've got to do it in a controlled way. Just like if you you don't want to just throw balls for a service dog, you need to you need to do it in a controlled way. I was and if you give them that approved way to hunt, they're less likely to try to chase down the squirrels and cats and other things in the mm -hmm. environment. That's made a huge difference in my dog. I was told by somebody that you don't let dogs, service dogs play chase because then they'll chase the, the tennis balls on people's walkers. I had to roll my eyes at that one. That was a little bit too far-fetched for me. The reason is because they'll chase the squirrels and the rabbits and the cats. Save that one because kind of a sneak peek of my monthly theme for April on the youperpaws.com website is going to be foolish follies and myths that are involved <laughs> in dog training. And that is a very good example. So save that one, make a note of it somewhere, and we will discuss that one. So just a plug for my website, since we are still chatting, is um, I do have a monthly theme. January was all about setting your training sessions up for success. February was all about um, focusing on getting the behaviors you want your dog to do. And you're part of this workshop, so you know the March focus was all about distractions. And now you know what April theme is going to be. So if you're looking for additional training tips and help, all of those are still available for you. Just look on the right-hand column of my website and you'll see quick, easy links to previous months and all the posts that were in that month. And I've kind of been behind on my blog lately, um, but Nick, we do have a um, the adventures of Nick the service dog on Facebook, and he's been updating his Facebook page um, and his Instagram account, which is Cindy underscore C um, training. I can pull that up real fast. And just um, share my screen again. I try to um, put something up there at least a couple times a week with what we're doing with him. So... There's Cindy's contact information and her website, um, cindycampbelldogtraining.com. And then she also has the, the Nick the Service Dog Facebook page. 
And then backing up one, there's my website we just discussed, the youperpause.com. And I also have the um, Facebook page, Youper Pause of Love. So you can contact either one of us through that. Easy enough. So we hope you enjoyed the workshop. Have a great night. Yes. And hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Yes.